Welcome to Chemistry at Hananiga High School. I'm Brian Brown, and today we'll be looking at our first set of notes dealing with dimensional analysis. Now, dimensional analysis is a specific method of problem solving that we're going to use quite a bit during uh, the second semester. Now, this is actually taught back in Chapter 3.4 of your book on pages 84 to 89, so if you need help, you can go back and look there. But we moved it from first semester to second semester because we taught dimensional analysis for dealing with metric conversions, and then we never used it again until second semester. So now we're going to practice it right before we're going to use it. Now, to understand a little bit about dimensional analysis, first I want to start with a question. Which is bigger, 120, 5, or 21? Now, to make a long story short here, honestly, no matter what you pick, I can make the others be the right answer because we're missing something really important. So, case in point, 5 is the answer. Well, how is that possible? Well, if I had 120 pennies, 5 quarters, and 21 nickels, 5 would be the largest. So you need to understand which is bigger. I can't answer that question unless I know what my units are because my units actually give meaning to the number. And in many cases, they're even more important than the number is. Quite often, the number is just what you copy and what you plug in your calculator and what you write down. It's the units that are going to derive what's going on. Now, dimensional analysis, dimension means unit. And analysis means problem solving. So really what we're doing is solving problems using the units. They're going to be the most important thing for you to write down and pay attention to. Numbers are just along for the ride. So we're going to use units in problems to solve them. Now, dimensional analysis is actually based on using what we call conversion factors. And that's a ratio that we use to convert one type of unit into another type of unit. Now, conversion factor is actually based on an equality. And then you're going to take that equality and we're going to write it as a ratio. Like one dime equals 10 cents can be written as one dime over 10 cents. Now, every equality actually gives you two different conversion factors. So both of these would be valid ratios for that one equality. And that's an important thing to remember. Every equality gives us two different types of tools. A tools that will convert one unit like cents into dimes. And written differently, we can use it to convert, to convert dimes into cents. Now, a ratio of two equivalent terms is then what a conversion factor is. And if what we put on top and what we put on bottom is essentially equal to each other, that means all conversion factors actually equal one. So since one dime equals 10 cents, the ratio of one dime over 10 cents is a ratio of two equal quantities. It's like four over four equals one. In this case, it's one dime is equivalent to 10 cents, but in essence, this ratio really does equal one. So when used correctly in a math problem, they allow us to convert from one type of unit to another. So case in point, this is a pretty way to write a dimensional analysis problem. Four dimes times our ratio of 10 cents over one dime. Dimes, top and bottom, they would cancel, and we'd be left in cents. So four times 10 divided by one must give us how many pennies that would be. And in this case, it would be 40 cents. Now notice that the unit dime actually cancels, cancels because it's on top and bottom, just like numbers on top and bottom can cancel. and uh, variables on top and bottom can cancel, so can units, because a unit is actually a part of the problem. And really what we've done here is we've multiplied by one. So one thing to remember is what we write here and what we end up with here are essentially two equal things. They're equal to each other because all we did was we multiplied by one. So it would be true that four dimes is equivalent to 40 cents. And the reason that's true is a conversion factor is essentially equivalent to one. Now, the numerical value is going to change, but the actual size of the quantity measured stays the same because four dimes really is 40 cents. Now, in order to do a dimensional analysis problem, we're going to use a very consistent uh, set of steps here. And the secret to the simplicity of dimensional analysis is because we're doing the same thing over and over and over, it can make hard things very, very easy because the process is always the same. But that's only true if you're going to be consistent and follow the process. Now, the first thing I want you down is read, read through the problem and figure out what the units of our answer are. Because the units are going to guide the problem, so we need to figure out what units are they asking us to get to. Then we're going to set up a simple workspace. And then finally, we're going to find out, well, what's our starting point? What units do they give us and how many of them are there? So here's a problem. How many dimes are in 30 cents? So how would I do step one, two, and three here with this type of question? Well, first I need to identify what the units of my answer will be. Remember, where it's asking the question is always where you'll find that out. So it says, how many dimes? So right there, I know I'm going to get to dimes. Now, the workspace we're going to use looks like this. It's going to be a slash with a line. And this actually represents 
parentheses and divisor signs, but it's going to be a quick, fast way to write it. So instead of a very pretty, you know, we have x and we're multiplying it times, ooh, what happened to my writing here? Let me try that again. We have 16 x's and we're going to multiply that by, oh, same thing is happening here. I guess I can't write too high. Um, 4y over 3x, and this can be written like that. 16x here, 3x there, 4y there. Fast, easy way to write a prettier math or algebra type of setup. So that's really what our lines look like here. And some people call them railroad tracks because uh, they kind of look like that as well. So we're going to set up some space to do our problem. And notice we left a space right here because that's where the answer is going to go, because we're literally setting up our problem and solution. And then finally, what's our starting point? What's our given? Well, it says we have 30 cents, so we're going to write that in that first spot. So that's how the setup to every single problem is going to end up looking. And as you see more of them, it'll make more and more sense. But those are our first three parts to the process. That's our setup. Now, the key to this whole process is really the solution, and that's steps four, five, and six. Now, step four is a question. Do I want to keep it? Now, if you don't, you're going to write the unit that you want to get rid of on the next line so that it cancels. So in the case of 30 cents, now the it is a unit. That's really important that you need to understand. The it here is it's the unit. It's not 30 cents, it's cents. So the question is, do I want to keep cents? And the answer is no. Well, if I have a situation where something is written on top, if I want to cancel it, that means it's got to be written on bottom somewhere. So really all this step says is whatever's on top that we want to get rid of, we're going to put that unit on the bottom so it cancels. Now, we will look at situations where we'll, there will be things written sometimes in this spot. We'll worry about that later when we get into more complex problems. But if we want to cancel something that's down there, remember it has to be on the opposite side. Now we got to put it on top to cancel it. But that's not the case for 30 cents. That's already written on top, so we need cents on the bottom. And that's all you do to step four. Whatever unit you want to get rid of, put it in the next step on the bottom or top to cancel. Step five is the most important thing to you get. So we're going to spend a little bit more time talking about that because that's really the key to the conversion factor. Because that's what we're doing here in this step is we're setting up valid conversion factors that will convert our starting point to our end point. So question five says, what can I change it into? Once again, the it is the unit. So really what we're asking ourselves is what other unit is it equivalent to? Because remember, a conversion factor is a ratio of two equivalent things. So I have to put on top something that I know equals cents. Now I know there's one nickel equals five cents, and I know one dime equals 10 cents, and one quarter equals 25 cents, and one dollar equals 100 cents. So I know a lot of things about cents. I could put any of those units up top because I've established a valid equality and I need to write a ratio of two equivalent things, so I could put nickels, dimes, quarters, dollars, anything else I know equals how many cents. If we knew how many pesos one cent equaled, we could put that up top too. But in this case, look at your target. So when you're doing step five, always look ahead and ask yourself, do I know how many dimes equal how many cents? Because if I do, that means I can write dimes up on top, and I can do this in one step. So a step is what we call a conversion factor. So in this particular case, I do know that there's 10 cents in one dime. So I have an equality that would allow me to convert from cents into dimes. So step five is really the key. On top, I want to put what unit I can change it into. And remember, I always have typically multiple options. But one of them is probably going to be the best option. In this case, look ahead. It asks dimes. So always ask yourself in five, can I go directly from cents to my target unit? If the answer is yes, put that target unit up top, put in the numbers that make them equal, and you'll be done. So remember, our goal is to change the target unit into so, or change into the target unit. So always look ahead and ask yourself if you want to know an equality between the unit on the bottom and the target unit. If we do, put it on top, and you're going to be done in one step just like we are in this case. Now, step six is repeat until the answer to number four is yes. So I go back to number four and I say, do I want to keep it? Well, I'm in dimes. So yeah, I want to keep it. So that means I move on to the calculation phase. My cents canceled, I'm in dimes, that's what I want. So that must mean this is my setup to solve this problem. So this is an example of what we call a single step problem. We used one conversion factor, to convert from our given to our target. 
So when I talk about one step or two step or three step problems, that's describing how many conversion factors it's going to take me to get from my start to my end. Now, the last is the calculation step. Now, step seven basically is everything on top is being multiplied. Everything on bottom is being divided into it. So when you go to our original problem here, what we're really saying is this. We have 30 times one on top and we have 10 on the bottom. So we need to divide 10 into the product of 30 and 1. So, of course, the answer is going to be step 8. Plug them in your calculator, let it spit out what the answer is. It's going to be 3 dimes, which you knew from the very beginning. And that's because when we start practicing dimensional analysis, we always try and pick easy problems. So you can double check, did your setup work? Because if you can get good at solving easy problems with dimensional analysis, then you can get good at solving hard problems with it, and they will seem easy. So keep in mind, with today's homework, you're probably going to be able to do a number of them in your head, and that's the point. We want you to be able to check your work to see, did you get the answer you expected? Now, a couple more things about step four that are important. Remember, do I want to keep it? The it refers to the unit. Don't recopy the number. That's a really common mistake. You don't move down the number, just the unit. And remember, the units are actually a part of your calculation, so always look to cancel units that are on top and bottom so that you can see, are you getting to where you need to go? It's a step that we typically ignore in math, but it's really a valid part of every single calculation. Step five, what can I change it into? Remember, that really means, what do I know it equals? So in the example that we looked at, we wrote dime on top because we knew there's 10 cents equaling a dime. But we also knew a number of other things about pennies, including the fact that it equals a dollar. So any of them could have gone on top. The thing is, they wouldn't have gotten us necessarily closer to solving the problem asked. Next thing, always look to see if you know an equality between the unit you're getting rid of and the target unit. Don't forget to look ahead. That's why we put the target there first so we know where we're trying to get. So if I'm canceling out cents and I want dimes, I realize, oh, I know how many cents equal how many dimes. So I put dimes on top and I'm going to be done after that step. And remember, if not, that means we're going to have to do and use more conversion factors. But the conversion factor we're going to use is going to get us a step closer. So we can get from point A to B, and then we can get from point B to C and be done. Now, in this step, what you're really doing um, is you're completing what you started in step four. Step four was the beginning of our process the beginning of writing a conversion factor, and step five completes it. So we're putting a unit we know up top that is equivalent to it, and then we write in the numbers that make them equal. And then at that point, we have a ratio of two equivalent things. We have a conversion factor. So technically, we just made one. So remember, 60 seconds equals a minute can be written as 60 seconds over a minute or one minute over 60 seconds. Either way, both of them are ratios of two equal things, so they both equal one. And what I want you to do is use this technique to do your homework in that first problem. So good luck on your homework.